Hi everyone, welcome back. This is the last session of uh, A Guide to Law of Evidence by Thomson Reuters and that is authored by C. Govind Venugobal and the uh, topic we are going to discuss is Burden of Proof. So that is discussed in section 101 to 114 that is part 3 of Indian Evidence Act. The Burden of Proof is called Honest Probandi. The Burden of Proof is nothing but Introduction of Evidence. The Honest arises one party or the onus arises when one party asserts something and another party denies it. The responsibility of producing the evidence is on the party who wants to prove his claim. The responsibility of producing the evidence is called the burden of proof. It plays an important role for the parties when dispute arises. The phrase burden of proof is used in two senses. The first one, burden of proving all the facts relied on his support in the case. The second, burden of adducing evidence in the beginning or at any stage of the case. Section 101. Whoever decides that the court should deliver a judgment in his favor in deciding a legal right or liability must prove that fact. The burden of proof is on such person who decides and this principle is called one who pleads must prove. So, one who pleads must prove that is said in section 101. For example, first one, A pleads that B shall be punished for the crime. A must prove that B has committed the crime. Second example, A decides that court shall give a judgment that he is entitled to the land in possession of B. So, A must prove it. This is the reason of the facts asserted by A and denied by B. A must prove the existence of those facts. Then, section 102, 102. The burden of proof lies on the person who would fail if no evidence is given on his side. This principle is called one who files a case must prove. So, one who files a case must prove is said in section 102. And one who pleads must prove is said in section 101. So, section 100 talks about one who pleads must prove. And section 102 speaks about one who files a case must prove. And for example, the first example, A sues B for money due on a bond. B contends that the bond was obtained by fraud. The burden of proof is on B to prove that it was on fraud. Now, the second one, A sues B for land which is in possession of B. A asserted title under a will executed by C who is B's father. B will be entitled to retain possession if no evidence is adduced by either side. The burden of proof is on A. Third example, a sues B for money due on a bond. The execution of the bond is admitted, but B condemns that the board bond was obtained by fraud. A would succeed if no evidence is adduced by either side, because the bond is not disputed and the fraud is not proved. The burden of proof is on B. Now, section 103, where the burden of proof as to any particular fact is on a person who wants the court to believe such fact, and if the fact is not proved, he cannot succeed. This principle is called he who wishes to prove a particular fact must prove. And section 104, the burden of proof is on such person who wishes to give such evidence of the main fact. This principle is called he who wishes to prove the main fact has to prove. For example, the first example, A wishes to prove the dying declaration of B. A has to prove B's death. Second, A wishes to prove by secondary evidence the contents of a lost document. A must prove that the document has been lost. Now, section 105. When a person is accused of any offence, the burden of proving the existence of circumstances to bring the case within any of the general exception in the Indian Penal Code or within any special exception or proviso is on him and the court shall presume the absence of such circumstances. The burden of proof is on, the, on such person who wants to claim any exceptions in IPC. This principle is called who, he who claims exception has to prove it. For example, insanity, drunkenness or self-defense. For example, 1. A. Accused of murder alleges that by reason of unsoundness of mind, he did not know the nature of the act. The burden of proof is on A. Second, A. Accused of murder alleges that by grave and sudden provocation, he was deprived of the power of self-control. The burden of proof is on A. Now, section 106. When a fact is within the special knowledge of a person, the burden of proving it is on such person. For example, 
Ace charged with traveling in a railway without a ticket. The burden of proving that he has a ticket is on A. Now, section one not seven. When a man, when a man is shown to be alive within thirty years, he is presumed to be alive by law. The burden of proving that he is dead is on the person who affirms it. That is the presumption of death. Now, section one not eight. When it is proved that a man is not heard for seven years, he is presumed to be dead by law. The burden of proving that he is alive is on the person who affirms it. So, ah, uh, section one not eight is presumption of death, and section one zero seven is the presumption that the person is still alive. Section one zero seven, that is, when a man is shown to be alive within thirty years, he is presumed to be alive by law. The burden of proving that he is dead is on the person who affirms it. So, the person is presumed to be alive. Whereas section one not eight, when it is proved that a man is not heard of for for seven years, he is presumed to be dead by law. The burden of proving that he is alive is on the person who affirms it. Now section one not nine, in the case of partners, landlord and tenant, principal and agent, if a person affirms absence of such relationship, the burden of proof of such absence is on him. That is a person who rejects such relationship. Now, section hundred and ten, where a person is shown in possession of a property, the presumption is that he is the owner. The burden is on the person who denies the ownership. Section hundred and eleven, in the case of good faith in transaction, the burden of proving good faith in transaction is on the person who is in possession of active confidence. For example, one, the sale by a client to an attorney is questioned in a suit. The burden of proving good faith in the transaction is on the attorney second the sale by a son who has just come of age to his father is questioned in a suit the burden of proving good faith is on the father now section 112 any person born one during the continuance of a valid marriage between his mother and any man or two within 280 days after the dissolution of marriage and the mother remaining unmarried now this is a it is a conclusive proof of his legitimacy Unless it can be shown that the parties to the marriage had no access to each other at that time, so that is with respect to uh, continuance of marriage. That is the uh, conclusive proof of legitimacy. That is section hundred and twelve. Now section hundred and thirteen a. When a married woman committed the offence of suicide, the presumption in law is that her husband or his relatives abetted the crime, and that is section hundred and thirteen a. Section one hundred thirteen B. When a woman had committed suicide within a period of seven years from the date of her marriage, the presumption in law is that her husband or his relatives had subjected her to cruelty. So, section one hundred thirteen A and section one hundred thirteen B is related to the suicide by a married woman and uh, dowry death or uh, cruelty for ninety eight A. Now, section one hundred fourteen. The court may presume the existence of any fact. Which it thinks likely to have happened, regard being had to the common cause of natural events, human conduct, or and public and private business in their relation to the facts of the particular case. The presumption under this section is, however, rebuttable. Now, the concept, the concept of burden of proof, is characterized under Section One Not One of the Law of Evidence Act, expressed that when an individual will undoubtedly demonstrate the presence of a reality, the burden to give proof to similar lies upon him. now the the expression burden of proof isn't characterized in the act anyway it is the simple standard of criminal uh, that that the assumption of blamelessness lies with the denounced except if they demonstrated something else so we have a case law here that is tirnamakku tirnamakku versus bandlu rangappa and others 1977 tirnamakku versus Bandlu, Rangappa, and others, nineteen seventy seven. Here, the child was born two eighty days after the dissolution of marriage, and the uh, child was held as legitimate. Sorry, ah, uh, child was born after two eighty days, so the court held the child illegitimate. Illegitimate. Now, with respect to legitimacy of the child, that is discussed in section one hundred and twelve. The fact that any person is born shall be conclusive uh, during the continuance of the marriage shall be a conclusive proof that he is the legitimate son under the following circumstance that is the first one during the subsistence of a valid marriage between his mother and any man the second within 280 days after the dissolution of the marriage 
provided that the mother remains unmarried it is however not conclusive proof if the parties had no access to each other at any time when he could have been begotten evidence that the child is born during wedlock is sufficient to establish legitimacy the following conditions must be f- uh, fulfilled to invoke the presumption of legitimacy the first one the child must be born during the marriage or within 280 days after the dissolution of marriage the second the mother must remain unmarried if the child is born after the dissolution of marriage third there must be access between the husband and the wife now we have a few case laws here the first one chillukuri venkateshwarullu versus chillukuri venkata narayana so chillukuri venkateshwarullu versus chillukuri venkata narayana 1954 the wife proved the visit of her husband to her house the supreme court declared the child as a legitimate child it observed that maternity is a fact while paternity is a surmise now sayyid sibith mohammad versus mohammad hamid and others 1926 sayyid sibith mohammad versus mohammad hamid and others 1926 the child was born within 6 month of 6 months after the marriage to a mohammedan wife the child was held legitimate on the ground that section 112 of the evidence act governed the case though the child was born within 6 months of, after the marriage the child was held as legitimate now another case law that is b one one vandana kumari versus p pravin kumar so b vandana kumari versus p pravin kumar that is in 2007 birth of the child during continuance of marriage was conclusive proof of legitimacy the same could be dis, uh, disproved by producing evidence that the parties to the marriage had no access to each other that was held in this case that is b vandana kumari versus p pravin kumar 2007 now section 113a of the evidence act deals with the presumption as to the abetment of suicide by a married woman when when once it is established that the death is by suicide the court can draw presumption that the suicide is abetted the prosecution in a case charged under section 306 ipc must first establish that the death is by suicide once that is established a presumption can be drawn under section 113a of the evidence act that the suicide is abetted thus the prosecution is relieved of the burden of proving one ingredient by virtue of presumption provided provided the prosecution in order to take the advantage of the presumption has to establish one that the suicide is committed within 7 years of marriage two that the woman was subjected to cruelty by her husband or her or his relatives there is no restriction on the matrimonial uh, period in order to charge a person to a uh, person for cruelty under section 498a so there is no restriction on the matrimonial period in order to charge a person for cruelty under section 498a of ipc similarly there is no such limit to charge a person for abetment to commit suicide under section 306 of ipc but the prosecution ta- prosecution can take advantage of the presumption under section 113a of the evidence act only when the suicide is committed within 7 years of the married life in all other cases the presumption is not valid not available and the prosecution has to prove both suicide and abetment under section 306 of ipc now presumption as to the abetment of suicide the involvement of all the accused person to commit the offense must be determined having regard to the entirety of the situation and the ma- materials on record section 113a of evidence act raises a presumption against the accused subject to the following condition the first one that the husband or any other member of his family had subjected the married woman to cruelty within the meaning of section 498a of ipc second the presumption is not mandatory and is only permissive according to the facts and circumstances of a given case that is with the end of this session that is uh, with respect to burden of proof and the relevant case laws discussed is thirnamakku versus bandulu rengappa and others 1977 chillukuri venkateshwarulu versus chillukuri venkata narayana 1954 sayyid sibith mohammad versus mohammad hamid and others 1926 and b uh, vandana kumari versus p pravin kumar 2007 and the burden of proof is discussed from sections 101 to 167 that is part 3 of uh, indian evidence act 1872 that is end, end of the sessions and the whole series of thompson reuters guide to law of evidence by c govind venugopal thank you for listening like comment and subscribe 
and if you have any books that you suggest for a read out loud please drop in the comment section and please click the bell icon so that you get an update when i upload a podcast or a video thank you for listening have a nice day bye